tests at Google. Um, my role of software engineer and test is one that a lot of people don't have a test or receive before. It means I'm a software engineer that enables testing. So I don't sit writing tests, I don't write tests for teams, I create infrastructure and work on libraries to, to help teams be able to test. So uh, one of the things I, I've done, I've been a committer on the Selenium project for about three years. Um, and that's, again, an effort to, to help developers and help, help people to write tests in the company. Um, so I'm talking about using Selenium at a Google scale. We use Selenium a lot at Google. We, we wholeheartedly believe in automated testing. And Google scale is, is pretty huge. So we, we have about 125,000 different browser tests across the company. Um, there, are about tw there are at least 20 changes per minute going into our code base. We have one code base. Uh, at, at peaks, we have 60, 70, 80 changes a minute. So more than a change a second. And we run every test which is affected by a change every time there's a change. So obviously, if I change Gmail, I don't run the tests for web search. But if I change a low-level library, I run every test which depends on it. So we run three to four million. We, we start three to four million browsers a day for test. And we do about five machine years of testing just with browsers each day. Um, now, he was talked very interestingly about a bunch of problems that you face. You face slowness, you face flakiness. If you think you have problems with flakiness when like one in a hundred tests fail, one in a hundred for us means 40,000. That's 40,000 emails that go out every day saying, oh, so then you didn't quite start properly. Um, that's not a fun thing to do. So we, we can't deal with one in a hundred. We can't deal with one in a thousand. We, we can deal with about one in a million. And with Selenium, that's pretty hard. I'm, I'm sure you've all, you've all felt that pain. Um, but we've worked a lot and worked out a lot of strategies and seen a lot of problems and worked out how to solve a lot of problems to make that pretty much a reality. The easiest way not to have tests failing, for no apparent reason, is not to have tests. <laughs> Um, oh, sorry, I apparently forgot to mention a thing. There are two important things that, I, that, that come from tests, right? So the, the qualities you get are trust. You get trust in your application, but you need trust in your tests to get trust in your application. And simplicity. I need to look at the test and understand what it's doing. I need to understand what it's telling me. So if the test fails, I need to know what went wrong. If the test passed, I need to have trust that my application is working. And if the test failed, I need to have trust that my application is broken. because. If at any stage you ever go, a test is failing, a test is always failing, your tests are useless. Right? I think I'm saying if you, if you look at it and it says 10 are failing, as long as it's not 11, that's fine, that's useless. Because you've lost all your information, you've lost all your signals, you've lost all your confidence. If, you, if a test failing doesn't mean something is wrong, you've got a problem. So you need trust in your tests, you need simplicity so you understand what they're doing. As I said, yeah, not having tests is the easiest way to have them not fail. And there's a bunch of ways you can do that. There's some good ways and some bad ways. You can, you can not write them in the first place, but then you don't get trust, right? If you, if you haven't written tests, then you're kind of hoping stuff works. Back in the day, maybe we did that, but we, we, we've advanced since then. Um, but the, 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 the sensible way to do it is to, to work out what information you want from your tests. Work out how you should be testing, work out what confidence you need, what you need to trust, and what you need to do to get that. So, just a, a quick show of hands. How many of you run your tests in like lots of browsers? Like Chrome, Firefox, IE? How many of you just one browser? Okay, interesting. So, um, the way you decide that is an interesting problem, right? Most people, when you say, we have Selenium, it works in all the browsers, we should run our tests in all the browsers. Well, yeah, you can do that. Selenium has the ability to do that. But it's not going to be fun and it's not going to be easy. Um, if, you, if you by default run your tests in all your browsers, one thing you're going to do is, is you're going to be using a lot more machine time. It's going to take a lot longer for you to get results. Because you, know, you have to either buy more machines or you need to run them back to back and it takes longer. One thing you're going to get is you're going to get more random failures. Because if, you fail test, uh, if your test fails one in a hundred times, if you run it a hundred times, it'll fail once. If you run it 400 times, because you're testing in four browsers, it'll fail four times. So if you only have to test in one browser, that, that's better. And there are ways you can do that. You can't always do that. But you have to think about what you're testing. 
So if you're testing browser compatibility, like if you're testing that your UI works in IE and Firefox, then sure, you run your tests in all the browsers. But if what you're doing is testing backend logic, like you're testing actually that uh, you know, your database is hooked up properly to, to your front end. And so you're, you're testing that when you click on a button, that's actually saved in the database. You're testing the database. You're testing your application logic. You're not testing browsers. So why are you running your tests in several browsers? Pick the fastest, pick the easiest, run in one. There are times when you need to run in more, but it's a trade-off, and you need to think about that trade-off. So you really need to think about what you're testing in a test. So then your tests are huge. They test your entire application. But you don't want to test your entire application just using Selenium. Right? You want to write smaller tests. So, so for instance, JavaScript tests, uh, as, as Dean was, was pushing, are, are much better ways of testing like UI widgets. They're, they're better ways of testing JavaScript logic because they're really fast and they're not flaky because they don't take up, like they don't bring up, you know, a, an entire database, an, an entire server, and another server it talks to, and talk to Twitter, and talk to, to Google Analytics. By the way, if you if you have Google Analytics on in your tests, something has gone horribly wrong, and your data is skewed. Um, yeah, so you have to think about what you're testing. If you're testing a front end, maybe you need multiple browsers. If you're testing a back end, you probably only need one. Even better, use no browsers. If you can test your back end just by writing a Java or Ruby or Python unit test, or, or a, a large test, but without, without starting a browser, you're going to have a better time. Because browsers take time to start up. You're restricted by how fast the JavaScript engine is. They fail sometimes. The fewer moving pieces you have, the fewer things you're using, the, the, the better chance you have. So an integration test, a test, a true integration test, a test that this component integrates with this component, integrates with this component. Ideally no browsers, maybe one. If you're testing functionality, ideally no browsers, maybe one. If you're testing browser compatibility, maybe more. But you really need to think about what value you're getting from starting a browser. Um, I talked to a guy a, a year or two ago who, with his team, they have a policy. Every time you want to write a Selenium test, you need to justify to the entire team. The entire team will sit in the meeting room. You need to justify to the entire team why no smaller test could possibly test what you're testing. You have to stand up and, and argue, not just Selenium is useful, other things aren't good enough. And it's rare that you win that argument, particularly when you've got 15 people who see their build failing every day because of a Selenium flow. You really need to think about what you're doing. Um, so now you, you, you've, you've decided not to write many of these tests, but you still need a couple, right? You still need confidence your application works. You still need a user style test to show that, that your application is all kind of working. And the way that you then make that reliable and not failing randomly and, and fast is by having control over the entire environment. So the, the ideal things we want, right? We want no random failures. We want 100% green or red, means 100% pass or fail, means 100% either the application worked or did. We don't want random failures. We want 100% reproducible results. If I run my test five times, I should get the same result five times. If not, that's a bad sign. This is a slightly weird one. But these next two are slightly weird ones, but, but they, they actually kind of make sense. They'll make more sense on the next slide. You want to be able to check out your exact state as it was a year ago. And if the test passed a year ago, you want, you want it to still pass when you check it out today. That's important. I, I, every now and then, you come across a huge problem with a release. But you don't find out about that problem for months, because it's really subtle. Like, you, you've got a logic bug somewhere which has been corrupting data silently for a year, and you don't realize, and then you find out, and you're trying to work out what the problem was. You're trying to debug it. And so you, you build your server from a year ago when it didn't have the problem, and you start trying to work out which change introduced the problem. If you can't run those tests from a year ago, that, that's really annoying, that's really unhelpful. Um, but you see that all the time. Like if you if you use virtual machines for your tests, you, you probably change the virtual machine configuration. Maybe it's changed so that, that test didn't run properly. Maybe you were depending on an old Twitter API, and the Twitter API has changed, and your old test relied on the old Twitter API, and suddenly your test is broken. These things happen. 
Um, what would be really cool, and, and we have this at Google, which is surprisingly useful, is if you have all these things, if, if your tests are completely reliable, the same input always leads to the same output, the same source always leads to a pass or fail, and you have complete control, you know, you're not reliant on Twitter APIs changing uh, externally, you can cache your test results. If I ran my test yesterday and I haven't changed anything, and I run it again today, I don't actually need to run anything. I don't need to start a browser, because I know what's going to happen. And suddenly, rather than sitting down and running my tests and going, I need to wait an hour for this browser to actually start and run through all the tests, you have confidence. You know, if you run the test, it will just say to you, nothing's changed. Here was the result from yesterday. And if you have all this control, you get your sanity. Because I know a lot of people who work with a lot of browsers, and all of them are, are made slightly crazy by that fact. I know that I am. So how do we get all these lovely properties? How, how do we get reliable tests, which give reproducible results, which will make us happy? You need to have control over the entire system. So your test code needs to be checked into source control alongside, alongside your application. Right? If your test code is separate from your application, that's a problem. You can't just sync back into the same application. Um, you need all your dependencies checked into source control. Um, if you're using Maven, you probably don't have this. Um, if you're using uh, like Ruby Gems, you probably don't have this. Um, maybe you do if you put in some effort, but you need to think about it. So if if I want to go back a year and and build my software again, if the first thing I do is is gem install uh, you know, YAML or something. And the API has changed. And Ruby, Ruby gems have a habit of just changing without telling you. Um, then you won't be able to build. You won't be able to run your tests. So, so that, that's the problem. You need control over all your dependencies. You need to know exactly what your dependency is going to be doing. You need your server, obviously, to be in source control alongside your tests. But bigger than that, you need to start up your server in your tests. You should never run tests. If you're testing what code is doing, if you're testing a change, you should never run tests against a staging server. Your test should always bring up the server locally. Because who knows what happens between you and the server. If it's on a different machine, there's a network in the middle. And that network can cause all manner of problems. If between your test and the server there's a network, that network may go down and your test will start failing. Or that network may suddenly get really congested and go slow, and your test will lose a race condition and will start failing. You really want to bring up your entire server local. And when I say your entire server, I mean the whole thing. If you, if you inject bits of Facebook code or bits of Twitter code into, into your application, you either want to mock that, or you want to make like a fake server locally, or you want to just disable it. Uh, one thing we, we've had some experience with is putting a proxy around the entire test. And if you ever try and reach off of the local machine, it just rejects the connection. It gives you like a 404. Because suddenly, when Twitter goes down, you're not dependent on that. When Twitter starts responding really slowly to your, your request for JavaScript, that doesn't slow down your test. Because actually, you're probably not testing the Twitter button. Right? In 99% of your tests, you don't care whether the Twitter button is there or not. But if it's there, and if it's going slowly, it will slow down your tests. It will cause you problems. You want to make sure that you always use the same browser version. And if you change the browser version, that should be versioned with your code. So I've made changes to tests to make them work in Firefox 17 when they didn't work in, when they worked in Firefox 16. Firefox 17 was released, my test started failing. I made some changes to my test code, which made it start passing. If I run those tests again, I want to use the same version of Firefox that my test was written for. If I make a change in the version of, in, in my test for the version of Firefox, and I go back a year. I want to run in the version of Firefox I was running in a year ago. You need the same thing for your Selenium version. If you change the version of Selenium you're using, occasionally we break things. Like, uh, sorry about that. You may have noticed every now and then it happens. We've been getting better about it, but in the past we've broken things. Um, so you want to you know, carefully control what version of Selenium you're using. If you update the version of Selenium you're using, you need to make sure that your tests work with that. Even the end images. Like if, you, if you change a VM image, that can break things. We've seen changing a virtual machine image break 5,000 tests before. Just because 
something about saving the VM, the VM got slower, or someone didn't quite set one of the internet security settings right, and IE kind of went, well, you've tried to load some script, and I don't know what it is, so I'm just going to ignore it. Um, so all of this is stored in our source control. We have VM images in our source control, we have browser binaries in our source control, which means that you're not reliant on other systems. You're not reliant on, on global state. Like the singleton pattern in, in programming is a really bad pattern, right? Because it's global state. It's hard to test. Anything can change it. Like uh, some new class that, that someone's written can change the global state, and suddenly my class can be broken. And having VM images, which which change independent of test code, is exactly the same thing. It's going. I've got this state over here. What my Internet Explorer is configured to do, and it's separate from my test code. And then my test starts failing because someone's changed the VM image. I have no information. If, if every single change you make is committed into your source control, then I can go, OK, yesterday someone committed a change to the VM image, and that's exactly when my test started failing. And you can check out the revision before they made that change and go, I'm using the old VM image. It passed. You, you broke my code. <laughs> I can prove it. And that gives you that, that trust and that confidence. Right? It's hard to have trust if there's random stuff going on around you. If you have one source of truth, your source repository, you can have trust that, that it, it works out, that nothing is changing without you knowing. So identifying every, every service you depend on, every file you depend on, every computer that needs to run to run your tests is really important. We've had tests start failing because DNS broke on the computers that we were testing on. Because you know you have DNS servers, and we, we have some custom DNS servers for, for kind of internal infrastructure. And DNS stopped resolving for Firefox. And that was really a problem for us. Because it took us three days. Well, yeah, we worked out that DNS was broken. Because you know DNS wasn't resolving. It worked out, it took us three days to work out why DNS was broken. Someone had changed the kernel on the machines. That unfortunately isn't in, in source control. And we, we you know, spent a long time investigating this. If that was in source control, I could easily have just blamed one person who had done it. We could have worked together to fix it. It would have been fixed nice and quick. So that's all the stuff you can keep in source control. And you, should keep, you should keep as much as you can in source control. But there's always going to be stuff you can't. Right? So, so Twitter do fantastic things, but they won't give me their source code. They won't let me start my own Twitter server. That can be a problem. Because if I'm testing an integration with Twitter, I want to know whether a change to my code or their code is broken. And right now, I don't know what they're doing. I don't know when they make changes. I don't know when they change their API. I don't know when they, they introduce bugs. And sometimes it happens. So you don't want to be communicating with Twitter if you're testing your code. If what you're doing is twist, testing your interaction with Twitter, you definitely want to be using Twitter. If you're testing that your code works the same as it did yesterday, if you're testing a change to your login system or whatever, which doesn't rely on Twitter at all, you don't want Twitter anywhere near your test. So use a proxy. Stop Twitter from being connected. Um, and, and Google Analytics, and, and it's amazing. We, we introduced logging, uh, just we introduced a proxy silently to every test that ran, to all the tests and logged every single external connection they made. It's kind of associated with the person who ran the test and the name of the test uh, for one day. And we got a list of, actually it's quite a short list, it was only 400 different post names. But that's 400 different people, 400 different companies who have some say in whether my test passes or fails. But I don't want to be tracking down, like the, you know, across the world, someone has made a change to this server and, and everything's horribly broken. So locking down the network for your test will suddenly give you all this reliability. It will give you control over what's happening in your test. It will give you control as to whether you have done something wrong or someone else has done something wrong. It gives you trust in the results of your tests. Because the number of factors that can affect your tests is limited. It's limited to exactly what you can see. So, we have these tests which don't make external connections, because we've seen the problems there. Everything is like versioned locally. 
We have browsers, which all just work locally. We have VMs, which all just work locally. And we haven't written very many tests, because writing lots of tests is a problem. We still have flakiness. Right? We still have problems in our tests. We still have problems in the code that we've written, which causes tests not to work out so well, to sometimes fail, to sometimes be slower. And so there's, there's a few things that, that we can do about the flakiness that's in our control. Right? One of the things is waiting. Um, we don't say this very often, and we should say it more. We don't say it because we're, we're ashamed of it on the Selenium project, but Selenium is an asynchronous API. When you click on something, what Selenium will do is, is go, I've clicked on it. Now what? And in an ideal world, what Selenium would do is go, I've clicked on something, and I've waited for a page to load, because I know a page is loading. And I've waited for some JavaScript to return, because you've got some Ajax happening, and your page hasn't fully loaded yet. And you've got some animation happening, and that's okay, I'll wait for that to finish. And, and now your page is done loading, here. Here's his control of Selenium back. But we can't do that, because that's a really hard problem. And it's a problem specific to each page that you're testing. So if you, like Twitter loads in the background a bunch of tweets using, using Ajax, but when you want to scroll down, it will, it will load more tweets in the background. If we waited after clicking for all the, all the Ajax calls to return, we would never let you control Twitter, because in the background there'll always be something happening. Um, so it, it's really hard for us to know when your page is done loading. It's really hard for us to know when your click is done. It's really easy for you to know. Like you know your pages, right? That's, if, if you want to know what an application does, you talk to the person who tests it. If you want to know how an application is set up and, and how it works, you talk to the person who tests it. Because that person has come across every problem and has had to investigate where every problem has come from, and has learned about all sorts of weird things that no one knows about. So as someone who's testing our application, you can wait for the right things. You know that when you click, you know, save, it brings up a little icon that bounces, and it goes, I'm saving, hold on a second. And then it disappears when it's done saving. So what do you do in a test? You click, then you wait for the little bouncer to appear, then you wait for the little bouncer to disappear. And that's what a user would do. Users are really good at inferring what's happening on your page because you tell them. Computers aren't so good at looking at a page and working out what it's doing. Um, so we need to give it hints. We need to tell it what it should be doing. And you need to wait for the right things. So when you're, when you're saving a user, you need to wait for a visual indication that the user has been saved. You can't just say click and just kind of wait for a bit. If you're just sleeping, well, maybe your database was a bit slow for that call. And maybe, you know, tomorrow it will take three seconds, but today it took four. Um, so you need to wait for the visual indication that a user would get that what they're doing is finished. And actually, that's quite a bit like accessibility testing. How would a blind user know that they can continue? How would a screen reader know? It turns out automation and accessibility are basically the same thing. If Selenium can use your website, a, blind, a screen reader can. If a screen reader can use your website, Selenium can. And that's a really useful way, actually, if you're having problems convincing someone that this whole Selenium thing is worth some time. Most countries have laws saying that you can't discriminate against the disabled, saying that blind users have to be able to use your website. Well, if Selenium can use your website, blind users can use your website. So it, it can help you gain traction if you, if you need to fight that battle. But we found that using accessibility locators is really reliable. Um, so it turns out some of our products weren't necessarily so accessible in the past. People have started testing them slowly. They've gotten more accessible because when you try and search for in a page for, for a, you know, the Compose button, if it has a text Compose, you can find it easily. Compose is fine, but if it's a text field, and if you're looking for the text field for the to address, particularly now that text fields are made of divs, because we've decided that you know input elements are just evil, it can get really confusing. But ARIA locators, which are used for accessibility, if they exist, they're really useful to use. So you should wait for a user visible indication that something is, has completed happening before you continue on your test. 
Um, you also should wait for acquiescence. That's a word. Um, basically means wait for, wait for things to generally be done. If you've got a load of drum script happening in a page, probably your browser is still kind of busy. Like, JavaScript is a single threaded language, so if the browser is doing something with JavaScript, nothing else can do anything with JavaScript. You know, if the, if the browser is busy in a loop computing like the first 10,000 primes, because, well, we're computing, so we compute primes. If your browser is busy doing that, then you're not going to be able to start clicking on elements. So, if you can find a way of getting a signal from the browser saying, I'm kind of done, you should wait for that. jQuery has, has a global property it exposes. It's called active, just dollar dot active, which is a count of how many things jQuery thinks it's doing. Every time you make an Ajax request, every time you start an animation, every time you start a DOM manipulation, it increments that counter. So if you're using jQuery, you can just sit there and go, well, active is still one, or still 10, or still 100. My browser is still doing things. It's probably not ready for me to do anything to it yet. So you should wait until a user has seen that they can continue, and the browser has said that you can continue. These seem like reasonable things, right? They sound like your help. You can look at every source of inconsistency. So every time a test fails for no apparent reason, we look at why. Like, you never see a flake and go, oh, it's just a flake, I'll rerun it. Well, that's easy, but it won't be any better tomorrow. It'll stay exactly the same, it'll get worse, because you're writing more tests. But if every time something fails for no apparent reason, you track down why, and you make sure that never happens again, tomorrow things will be better. The day after things will be better than that. And apparently in 18 months, you'll have 100% stable tests. So some things we've seen before, network delay. If you have one machine here talking to one machine here, the tests will have variable performance. Your tests will sometimes just fail. So have everything on localhost. If you start everything in the test, everything will be on localhost. Machine load is a fun one. So we run tests in parallel on machines. Um, and actually, the way that at Google we run our tests is we basically use our data centers, because we have you know, huge data centers, and we just kind of steal small amounts of resources on machines that are running Gmail, or machines that are running like web search, or machines that are running you know, the, the services we have. And so the performance of my test is not only affected by what my test is doing, and affected by what other tests are doing. It's affected by how busy Gmail is. That's not the place you want to be. Um, so we've started monitoring for machine load. When a test fails, we do a quick check. How busy was the machine? Was the CPU at like 90% or at like 10%? If it was at 90%, that's a signal that, well, maybe something went wrong there. Maybe something you know, happened which wouldn't normally happen. Um, and the ways that you can deal with that are, are kind of complicated. But I'll, I'll get onto those a bit on the next slide. Or maybe at the bottom of this one. Who really knows? Um, and third party services. You, you absolutely don't want to use them. I can't emphasize, emphasize this enough. If you have Google Analytics loading in your tests, stop now. Just don't let it happen. Um, but when you've dealt with all this that you can, right? so you, you've got a few tests which all run on one machine, and everything is versioned in source control, and you're waiting for the right things. Still, sometimes things fail. Because you're still working with a lot of moving pieces. Still, you have a browser. Sometimes a browser fails to start. Sometimes they just do that. They do it more in tests than for real users. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes, like, a net server has crashed. Sometimes you exploit a bug in Flash, which takes out the entire machine. Not that we've seen these things happen, but these have all happened. Um, and so, your last ditch kind of hope, when all else has failed, is to retry the test. Because what I need is trust in my test. I need to trust that whenever it goes red, something is broken. So if I can detect, like if the machine load was high, or if I can detect that a network went down, which I really needed to depend on, we now have systems internally which, if, if you've collected a signal which shows that the test was maybe not a real failure, we automatically retry the test. Which means that if it passes then, we say your test passed. Because we don't want to annoy you. We don't want to tell you your test is failing when it's not. You'll lose confidence in the tests. 
If it fails again, we tell you it failed, because it's probably failed. But you really need to track that. One of the problems you get is your test gets slower. If, if you just start doing this quietly, suddenly you can just be running every test twice, because they fail a lot. If you're running every test twice, you've doubled the time it takes to get results. That sucks. You've doubled the number of machines that you need. That sucks. Um, also, when a test fails that's kind of random, that can expose real bugs. Like we've seen race conditions in your application, which a flaky test showed. And it looked a lot like the test was flaking, but actually it was a problem in the application. And so if you just ignore these and retry them, you can be blind to real bugs. Because you're not you're not anymore treating your, your tests as, as kind of reliable. You're treating your tests inherently as unreliable. And that's dangerous. So you need to track how often you start retrying tests. And it should only ever be used as a last resort. And if that number goes up, if your tests seem to be getting less reliable, you need to look at why. Maybe the coders are getting sloppy because they know that their tests will kind of pass even if they fail every now and then. And I don't know about you, when I write code, occasionally I do sit there and go, I'm, I'm kind of lazy. I, I know this will kind of clean up for me, so I'm not going to be quite as careful and quite as thoughtful as I could be when writing this test. If I know that I'm going to get an email from someone saying, we noticed that your commits have been quietly breaking the build more often. We haven't been shouting at you because we don't want to you know, throw everyone off, but you need to write better code because you're causing problems and I have numbers to prove it. That can be a compelling argument. So you really need to track everything you do which feels bad. Like retrying tests feels bad. In an ideal world, you wouldn't have to do it. So you need to track whether you're getting better or worse at the, the kind of nasty things that you do because you feel you need to. So we have these reliable tests, which we now trust because we don't have very many of them. And they don't use external resources. And we wait on the right things. And when they fail, we make sure that they've really failed. And if not, we deal with that. But do we have simplicity? How do you get simple tests? How do you interpret the results? How do you work out what really happened? So this is a really hard problem. <laughs> Like I, I was looking at the, the output of Jasmine, and I, I complained a little bit about, about the readability of the test, and also the results. Because the stack trace that you get is like four lines of, of Jasmine saying something, and then one anonymous function, and then a single line number which is useful to you. It's like, this assertion failed. That's, that's not particular to Jasmine. That, that's what most of any tests look like. Because you're testing kind of as a blank box. You're testing and basically saying, as a user, poke the server, and make sure it pokes back. And that's really far away from what's happening in the server. And that's kind of the point of Selenium tests. The point of Selenium tests is you don't really care what happened on the inside of the server, you just want to make sure it works. You want to make sure that the user gets the right result. So that makes it really hard to debug failing Selenium tests. Because all you know, from all your Selenium tests are saying, is something didn't work. Like if you ever tried to kind of, I, I know my, my, my grandmother, bless her, she's getting into technology, she uses email now. Every now and then she'll call me up and go, my computer doesn't work. <laughs> and I'll say, what doesn't work? And she'll say, my computer. <laughs> and I'll say, what were you trying to do? And she'll say, I was trying to use my computer. <laughs> and this goes on for four or five minutes until I go and visit her. And it's obvious that she was trying to connect her printer. And, you know, it's nothing at all. And that's what a Selenium test does, right? It goes, the element wasn't red. And I go, what color was it? And it goes, the element wasn't red. And I go, well, what, what happened to make it not red? And it goes, the element wasn't red. It's a problem. So there's a bunch of really useful diagnostic information that you want. And it's the kind of stuff which actually, when you're debugging a test, the stuff that you add. But then when you're done debugging the test, you delete it. Video. So the first thing you do when you've got a failing Selenium test is you watch it, you run it locally so you can watch it. Because most of the time it's obvious what's happened. Like most of the time you look at the UI 
And it's obvious that something didn't render properly or something was broken. So you take a video. Ideally, you take a video of every test, or at least every failure test, by default. Because then I don't need to run that test locally, I can just watch the video. There's a bunch of uh, browser and the cloud providers who make your life easy because you don't need to manage virtual machines. They make your life easy because you don't need to you know, deal with browser configuration. And they deal with stability of the browser provisioning. A lot of them also offer, offer video for all their tests. I, so we, Selenium as a project uses Source Labs who um, gladly donate some of their resources so that we can test Selenium so that we don't break the guys. Um, and they record video of every test and they record a log of everything that you did. And it's so useful to just be able to watch a video of your test because you'll see what happens. Um, sometimes it's not quite that obvious what happens for a video. Sometimes you need to actually interact with the page. Sometimes like a JavaScript object is, is kind of wrong, or sometimes an element is like in slightly the wrong location, which you can't necessarily see for a video. And dumping the entire DOM of a page, so the HTML, the CSS, the JavaScript, the images, everything. You know, like Chrome, Firefox, I even have a, like, a right-click save page to folders often. You want to do that every time a test fails. Because the next thing you do after you've seen your test fail locally, right, is you, you open up the page and you start clicking and you're like, if I do what the test does, what happens? And if you have a DOM DOM, if you've saved the entire page to disk, you can do that without having to start a server, without having to run a test, because you already have the HTML there. You can just look at it, you can interact with it, you can use Firebug or you know, the Web Inspector or whatever. It just works. You want to grab the Selenium box, because you want to be able to correlate the timings. You want to know when this thing happened in the video, that was just after I clicked on an element. So you want to log every command that you do, and you want a timestamp on that. And so you can kind of go, just after I clicked on this element, nothing happened in the page. Something went wrong. You're not going to tell from a video whether that click happened or not. You can tell from a Selenium log whether it tried to click and what it tried to click on, and you can work out what happened. And those are kind of the obvious ones. Like, that's the stuff which obviously you kind of want from a test. But that's still a black box. That's still looking at it from the outside going, what is this test? What's happened? It's, it's not telling you why it happened. The, the single most useful thing that a lot of our teams have found is dumping server exceptions in your test log. So most servers have monitoring set up, right? So when an exception is thrown, it logs it to a database somewhere. And when too many are throwing, it emails you, or it calls you. Because if you start throwing exceptions in the middle of the night and no one can buy your products, that's a problem. So you already have technology in place so that when an exception is thrown, you do something with the exception. Hook it up to your test block. When your server throws an exception, I want to see that in my test. I want to see that it couldn't communicate to the database server. And you already have the technology in place, you just need to wire it up. Similarly, the server logs. If you started the server locally, you can just redirect the output of the server into a log. And if you log this all in one file, and if you log this all with a single time source, so we, we have a library which actually logs this stuff. It, it, it adds a label as to what it came from. So this was the server, this was a Selenium log, this was an exception that happened, um, this was like debugging output from your test that you had like a print line statement. And we have those, so they're saved, and this is really easy to do, you just need to get around to doing it. They're saved with a label as to what produced the log, a single timestamp from when the library saw the logging statement. Um, and it means in the UI we can collapse logs. We can say, well, I'm looking at the entire thing, but the server actually is really noisy and it outputs a bunch of UI, so just hide everything the server produced. I just want to see like the, the Selenium logs and the test, you know, the test log and any exceptions that were thrown in, you can do that. Because you have saved in a single database or a single file just a list of, of every logging command that happened from every place, what happened in the timestamp. Um, but logging from servers is, is far and away the, the, the biggest improvement that we've seen in working out what happened when your test fails. So I would, if, that's one, if there's one thing that you try and do, get exceptions from your servers logged into your desktops. 
Um, also, there's a bit in it, you know, simplicity isn't just looking at results, it's also looking at the tests. So, you want a readable test. You want a test where you can see what's happening and you can work out what's going on. You can work out what it's trying to do. You can work out why it's trying to do it. You can, you know, it's not just a list of click, 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 get text, get title, click, submit. That doesn't tell you what you're testing, right? On the other hand, if you have methods which are descriptively named, like login, which happens to type and type and click, but it's login. It gives you an understanding as to what a test means. If your test reads, login, add book to cart, buy, check that, my cart, uh, check that I have a, an order number, that makes a lot more sense than send keys, send keys, click, get, click, 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 click. I have a big shopping cart. Send keys, send keys, send keys. Wait, one of those was a credit card number. Which one? Who knows? Like it, if you extract meaningful method names, that can suddenly make your tests really useful. But yeah, people who write software have a tendency of creating things which are slightly too complex. You don't want to go too far down this path. Um, so there's, there's an old saying in software, you know, don't repeat yourself, keep it dry. Sometimes it's okay to repeat yourself in a test, if it's more clear. If I have to click through five different methods to work out what you're actually trying to click on, I'm going to have a hard time debugging your test. And if your flow involves all the clicks that I just mentioned, I'm going to have a much harder time debugging your test, because I need to work out for every one of those what you were doing. So try and keep kind of method calls one or two deep, and try and keep them user-oriented. So think in the terms of the user. Logging in is something a user does. Adding to cart is something a user does. Selenium is all about testing like a user. So use the language of the user. Everything should be semantically, semantically meaningful. Everything should be in terms of how a user would think about it. So in summary, don't write Selenium tests. In your, when you have to, be really careful about them. Control all of your dependencies. Make sure you know everything that's going on so you have some trust. Log obsessively. Log everything you can think may ever be useful. You can always delete the logs, but if they're not there, you're going to have a hard time. Always think why. Always be, be the, the annoying five-year-old who just, you know, goes why, and you give him an answer, he goes why. Give him an answer, he goes why. Always do that. Why are we testing in five browsers? They're all unstable. If we tested in one, we could focus more on stability. Why are we using Selenium for this? We could test this using just JavaScript testing. Always ask why. Remember that everything's a trade-off. Selenium will introduce slowness and flakiness, but it also gives you confidence that what your users are trying to do works. I didn't get a huge amount of confidence that what my users are trying to do works from a JavaScript test or a Jasmine test, because it doesn't show that a user can do anything. But I get speed. And always be considering that trade-off. Always think about what you're getting and what you're giving up. Because a lot of times we make default decisions. We assume we should test in all the browsers. We assume we should write a test for this feature. We assume we should write a test for this edge case. Think about the maintenance. Think about the flakiness. Think about whether that's really worth it as a trade-off. But yeah, that's how we test with Selenium and Google. We think about everything we do. Any questions? Uh, first of all, thank you for, for your speech. It was really interesting. Thank you. Uh, at the beginning, you said that uh, if something changes in Gmail, uh, you run an uh, old test that depends on the, G on the Gmail. Uh, can you please elaborate how you actually track dependencies of tests to some features? Uh, right now, that's mostly manual. So um, if you think uh, of Ant or, or Rake or something, you have lots of, kind of ideas of projects. And basically, we, we write out kind of each task. We say, these source files kind of are related. These are together. And these source files test these source files. So we write down 
These tests depend on this code, and transitively that depends on this code and depends on this code. So we just have a big tree which we've manually curated. Um, we would love to be able to do this automatically, like using static analysis or code coverage, or there's a bunch of ways that you can kind of work out what code is affected by what code. But we found that none of those techniques are quite mature enough to trust them, and we care about trust quite a bit. Um, it's an interesting research area. Like we've done some work in static analysis, working that out. But at the moment, we just write it out by hand. Um, so just in some file, text file, text dependency. So uh, so our, our build system is a custom one. But basically, if, think of Make. Have you used Make? Um, so Make has a bunch of tasks. Our tasks are more functional than that. So our tasks are this group of files rather than these things that you do to this group of files. So we have a Java library which you know what to do, you run Java to compile it, but all we say in a build file is there's a Java library which is these files and it depends on this library. And so then we basically use makes uh, dependency analysis to work out what needs to happen. We don't actually use make, but it's the same idea. Uh, thanks for the speech. Uh, that's cool. cool. Uh, so you, you uh, uh, advise to uh, track all the logs, all the all those things. So uh, uh, you have uh, in the end of the test, you, you probably have some 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 kind of timeline. So uh, do you have uh, any tool that actually uh, aggregates uh, in itself all these logs? So you can watch, for example, the video and uh, the timeline of for exceptions and the time of, of load and, and stuff like that. That's something I, I've been wanting to do for a while. Um, if anyone's interested in coming and implementing it, my team is hiring. <laughs> we, so we have that for logs. So logs are output in time, but it doesn't associate with video. Um, associating it with video would be wonderful. Um, so Source Labs, who do browsers in the cloud, give you logs and they have a screenshot with every Selenium command that you executed. Um, so that, that is the first step there. It doesn't quite, so they have video and they have logs with screenshots. Logs with screenshots kind of help. It's not quite a full solution, but it's a lot better than nothing. Um, it would be really cool though. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, my question is also about um, uh, interpreting the results of tests. Uh, the first question is about screenshots. You didn't mention them uh, when talking about, about the kinds of uh, logging you are doing. And the second question is uh, about uh, analyzers of those. So, um, screenshots are, at the moment for screenshots, we just use the signing API, you can take a screenshot and we just save that to a file. Um, and we just basically dump all the screenshots we've taken into a folder. Um, it like in order, which isn't very useful, it doesn't associate with time, but it, it just works. You'd rather be better. Uh, DOM dumps, uh, I don't know, if, so for Firefox specifically, there's a project, I think called Hotshots, which is a Firefox extension, which will grab a screenshot and grab the entire DOM of the page. Um, I think for Chrome there may be something similar. We don't have one good answer for that at the moment. We've written some custom code and it works in some browsers but not others. Um, again, it would be awesome if there were an open source library to do that. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, about some uh, failures, uh, not cause of uh, Selenium bad, but cause of, of application. For example, on our project we have uh, some test failures uh, when uh, it's choosing expiration date and month. Uh, and for example, it's choosing date uh, and month, then clicking uh, submit button. But uh, when the data appears that the date and month doesn't uh, enter. Uh, manually it's not reproducible, but in Selenium test for some reason we still kept getting this error. And for example, in this uh, moment, what can we do? Even with some delays, it's still uh, reproducible. So and we don't know, uh, no logs showing nothing. If it's reproducible, the, the best thing by far to do is to file a bug with the Selenium project, because it's probably our fault. If it doesn't get reproduced manually, or only reduces with Selenium, it's probably us. Um, the things usually include in that bug report, and this is important, and even we'll talk about this a lot more later. A reproducible test case. 
we need the, the, the HTML you're trying to automate. It doesn't have to be the HTML in the page you're doing, but we need some HTML which shows the problem. So you need to kind of reduce that page until you have the minimum amount that we can, we can see what's happening, and then we can debug that. In that process, you may find the answer. I find in creating a reusable test case, you tend to actually find what's causing your problem. Um, but yeah, if you can file a bug, uh, selenium.googlecode.com, um, and attach an HTML file and say, when I click on this, uh, it doesn't you know, select anything, um, we can try to get that fixed point. Uh, sounds like we're, we're somewhat out of time, so uh, I'm going to be around if there are more questions. Grab me whenever, um, ideally in a pub. Um, <laughs> <laughs>